it's kind of like putting your hand into the cookie jar. As we were going lower and lower on interest rates, people borrowed significantly more. So we were grabbing more of the sweets in the jar till eventually we had such a big handful. You can't get the hand back out. You can't go back up um, on the basis that you've got so much. You'd have to drop it and that's bankruptcy. That's, that's failure uh, to get your hand back out. So the interest le level for system failure is probably not very far from where we are, even if we maintained it just at these current levels. The need to rein in inflation requires a far higher level. Hi, I'm Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and this is the Miles Franklin Weekly Special for October 25th through November 1st, 2022, while supplies last. This week, we feature two silver specials. First, we have 90% silver at $11.49 over spot. Prized for its recognizability, liquidity, and easy divisibility, constitutional or junk silver is also in short supply. As Andy Sheckman says, they're not making any more of it. Our 90% silver is mixed, meaning it may come as dimes, quarters, or both, but it has the same silver content either way and is available at $11.49 over spot while this batch lasts. Our second silver special is 100 ounce Pamp Suisse Silver Bars. Known for their quality and artistry, Pamp makes these IRA eligible bars three nines fine and with their own individual serial numbers. They come five to a box and are available at only $4.59 over spot. Our number for all orders is 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends and we look forward to speaking with you. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today for the second time. He was quite popular the first time we had him on, so we had to have him on. Francis Hunt, thank you so much for joining us today. Delighted to be with you again. Thank you for the invitation. And your website is The Market Sniper. So people, uh, if you're interested in what you hear today, find that link in the description of that video uh, to that website there. Uh, Francis, I would like to discuss first what we're seeing in the bond market in the U.S. and also uh, foreign bonds around the world. It's very an interesting environment right now and possibly quite concerning. Yes. Uh, despite the dollar having a little bit of a, a calming period and being a little bit off, uh, I, I continue to assert that this is a pause in what is a macro move of dollar strength, mainly on account of the U.S. 10-year market. So it's very interesting you start us there on the debt markets. I think you're, you're, you're right. We are in a debt-based system. And there's this interesting uh, juxtaposition of foreign forex and debt. And the fact that you can't view them as two separate silos. If you have one nation state, the United States of America with the Federal Reserve doing tightening uh, of rates uh, at one of the more aggressive rates, and also withdrawing debt support, and you have other nation states uh, not tightening as quickly and still in certain select areas doing a certain amount of bond support. So if you think of the Euroland uh, investing in the uh, supporting Italian treasuries and French treasuries as well, uh, debt, and you see the Japanese, the most extreme case, actively participating in maintaining the 0.25 rate, which requires a lot of printed currency to sustain um, the purchase, the, 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 the bond market at its current levels. You have a contrast. So for the first time in a long time, we actually have a far more dynamic Forex market, which is one of the release valves. Either the debt goes down in value and the rates are allowed to climb, or if nation states participate in supporting that debt value and not allowing price discovery, becoming a big participant that wants to maintain a distortion, what you're doing is keeping a pressure canister still under great pressure and you're not allowing the one release valve to work. What tends to happen on a two release valve system is that the, the, the pressure then moves to the other valve. And that's what's causing currency dislocations uh, that have seen the dollar be very dominant despite pausing. Uh, and this is part of a, a, an orchestrated failure of the fiat market starting in one place. And we've always asserted that the dollar will be the last domino and one of the biggest to fall. So if you think of those smaller dominoes knocking down ever greater ones, you, get, you eventually get to the big one. But you've got to allow things to play out. And then this then brings the great question to which ties in kind of precious metals into this, because at the, at the end of the day, um, a lot of your viewers are here for the metals, is 
why run from a pound to a dollar or why run from a, a yen to a dollar if maybe in the long term case all things end at precious metals and that after the dollars had its big uh, move uh, of relative strength against everything else and there's currency rushing into it uh, maybe you should be more concerned about securing supply on gold before everyone realizes that's one of the best games uh, in town. So you can play the dominoes as they fall, or you can go straight to the end game. You might benefit and you might even profit out of the dollar strength short term, but you've got to make sure the music stops and you don't have a chair. And for me, the chair is uh, the precious metal. So it's quite a long uh, answer and quite a bit to unpack in there, but the, the debt markets are the driver. And the USD tenure, you're at 0.33%. Uh, at the uh, the COVID yield lows, which is of course the highest value of debt, and now you're through four percent. So that's not that's not a ten x. That's almost uh, a twelve and a half x. So people will watch the yields coming a little bit down right now, but it's a very stable, consistent increase in uh, yields. And uh, as long as the yields are going up, the debt value going down, and the American market is dominating and is the lead steer for rate increases relative to other nations, money has this weird principle of going where it's treated best, Elijah. Uh, and as a result, it flows away from British pound or particularly yen, where it might only get 0.25% uh, and is losing incredible amount of buying power in the currency uh, as the primary release valve where devalues to going where it's treated better, where there's actually a prospect of currency appreciation and also a higher rate uh, to be paid. So this is what we're essentially seeing at the moment. And for now, it's a dollar story, but it, it will pivot uh, soon. And that, of course, affects the paper price for gold, because in essence, oil and commodities are inverted correlated. But people should be exploiting that opportunity, in my view. And it seems like stresses are appearing in the system right now as we're seeing the dollar near 20 year 20 year highs and we're seeing a you know collapse in the prices of bonds because if you know interest rates rise then the value of the bonds go down so what kind of ramifications do, do these interesting price valuations and distortions have on the broader financial system well uh, I, one point we we made um, and I was Really relieved to see we're keeping good company. Stanley Druckenmiller recently also uh, made uh, is that you don't rein in inflation. It's never happened that you've passed 5% of inflation, which all the major first world nations of the world have surpassed. I think in the States, you threw the 8%, the UK is on 10.1. Um, you never rein back inflation with a lower rate of interest than the inflation rate. So I, I, I give it an analogy of uh, I've jumped into uh, my Porsche Turbo a day and a half ahead of you, Elijah, and we're doing the cannonball run across the states. And we started in New York and the, the end game is to get to L.A. Uh, and I've, I've got my foot flat and I am doing um, 80 miles an hour to represent 8%. You jump into a golf cart and you're doing 3.25%, which is 32 and a half miles an hour. It's quite a fast golf cart, but it's a golf cart nonetheless. Um, not only am uh, you unlikely to catch me, but the rate at which I am extending a lead over you, apart from the fact that inflation got away long before the Fed started to react, they were late to react. Uh, they insisted on transitory. They first said it never existed. Then they said it's temporary transitory. They went through all the denial game. So you you failed to recognize we were in a race. I always felt we were in a race. I've ripped uh, halfway through the Midwest and you're just getting started. There's no way that distance between us doesn't get larger in spite of the fact that you've started a tightening process and started to race after me. You are giving up ground for every moment that we race. Uh, so the only way, if I'm the inflation monkey who's jumped into the Porsche Turbo, that you rein me back and get me back under control is that you, A, get quickly to a point where you are going quicker than I am so that you are closing that gap and you have to maintain that speed for a sustained period before you catch me. A, I stole a run on you, I stole a base, 
I jumped the gun, and B, I'm going faster than you. So the notion that inflation will be contained um, at current levels of rate is absolutely false. So if you accept an 8% on official government statistics, which there's a separate level of query you can take, ergo shadow stats that apply the old Russian uh, Ronald Reagan um, uh, formula, which will say it's a lot higher, but let's us accept that as factually accurate, You've got to get rates above 8% and not slightly above. If you only get it marginally above, it's like you're chasing me down uh, at doing 83 miles an hour and I'm doing 80 and I'm a day and a half ahead of you. You're only going to, you're going to make an incremental gain over the remaining days, but I'm going to get to LA before you. Um, you've got to win that race. You've got to go faster. You've got to catch me and you've got to surpass me to make sure you rein me back. Um, and this is why essentially the true fact of uh, reining back this inflation would require a level of interest rate that would automatically cause entire systemic failure. People will argue we're actually already at that point uh, and you're already seeing a lot of um, creaks. The, you know, the submarine, the bolts are already popping on the submarine in terms of the pressure. So. There is no way. It's I, I talk of this in an analogy. It's kind of we're we're racing down a, a strip of land, but instead of the land having two parallel lines, they taper towards each other. One is system failure due to too higher interest rates, and the other one is the runaway inflation that uh, you fail to contain. We end up falling over one of those sides, even if we try hold the middle line. Eventually, they taper to a point, and we ramp off the edge, and we fail by. Both. Both. So at some point, um, you're on a plank that is tapering. Um, and each day we are naturally progressing forward. So you either have a systemic failure. Just imagine if we just skipped straight to the US at 9.5% to be a, a, a serious amount over the CPI. I mean, just imagine the real estate market, never mind the derivatives, never mind everything else in the shadow banking system. It would just be brutal. The level of debt that was added, and so I use another analogy to explain that, it's kind of like putting your hand into the cookie jar. As we were going lower and lower on interest rates, people borrowed significantly more. So we were grabbing more of the sweets in the jar till eventually we had such a big handful, you can't get the hand back out. You can't go back up. Um, on the basis that you've got so much, you'd have to drop it. And that's bankruptcy. That's that's failure uh, to get your hand back out. So we've loaded up on the cheap uh, and now we can't afford it on any level of uh, down. So the interest le level for system failure is probably not very far from where we are, even if we maintained it just at these current levels. The need to rein in inflation requires a far higher level, uh, something that you might even rep, uh, you know, uh, require a similar level of Falker era um, rates. Now you've got to remember US was far less indebted during that period, uh, far more robust, was exporting far more strongly, had a better trade deficit and surplus. It just was a different country um, in terms of that, that period. So I think that probably is a lot of analogy and there's quite a bit for you to unpack there. And I think one of the things that you mentioned is uh, the rates that we are right now may even be concerning. I was just interviewing Adrian Day of Adrian Day Asset Management, and he was talking about how there's always a lag effect. Um, and the damage that the Fed has already done by raising rates to these levels hasn't been uh, hasn't been seen yet. There's still a lot of damage to be seen from what the Fed has already done. Your perspective on that? I think he's 100% correct. Um, there is absolutely. I mean, say you were refinancing your property, you may only be due, say you're on a two-year discount rate or whatever the case may be, you might be coming due in a few months' time. And now you stand, the effect on your personal wealth and balance sheet is only going to meet that effect when you go to the market and say, I want another two-year fixed rate, or I want a five or a 10-year because I'm deeply concerned about the, you know, the, 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 the consequence of interest rates here. I want to I want to reduce my risk. Well, the deal you'll get today, person X, only being prompted for a refi anniversary now, um, that effect only comes to. So most people are initially unaffected by it. Um, some things will have uh, immediate moves, um, but most things are, it's only come when their personal anniversaries or certain deals come up for renewal. And that's when you're going to go, really? I'm a, that could mean 30% more uh, on, on an installment uh, to be paid. A car finance, various other things. Maybe some of those things that are already variably attached might 
might start filtering through. But initially, people still have some savings or they have some bandwidth and they can pay it, but they hope things get better. And it takes a while before they go, I can't afford this. Now, I've now got no more fat. You might have a little bit of fat in your body and you can stand the cold. But eventually, after not eating, um, you, you get pretty lean and you haven't got any buffer sailings. You haven't got things to sell. You haven't got any little accounts stored there. And then you start to get the knock effect. So he's 100% right. Uh, the, the effect of that is, is knock on. And, it's, and it actually escalates the deeper in you go. But it's not just the initial price increase. It's the sustained nature of that initial price increase that erodes you. Water wears rock down, not in a minute, but in millennia. Uh, and this is much harder, faster flowing um, and eroding force uh, on your personal wealth than, uh, than water. And it seems like we're entering a completely different environment that we've seen uh, for so long. And one of the effects you're saying of this is that we're seeing these price distortions, we're seeing the dollar rally, and it might even rally more. But the end game is that people will kind of abandon or move away from fiat currencies in general, it seems like, and move into precious metals. So can you explain a little bit about that and why it's important to be ahead of the curve here? I don't think the authorities are going to subscribe to what you just said. I think personally, as as individual sovereigns, we should. Um, in, I, I actually think there'll be a few jokers uh, in the pack that they might pull to try make that less attractive. Um, but nonetheless, I think we have to persevere. I think we have to get over this notion that uh, government a, is um, an actor uh, a white hat actor that has your best wealth in in mind and more in lines with they have their own perpetuation of power in mind and often at your expense. So uh, overall, uh, the, the digitization of everything is going to lead to a lot of personal privacy, a loss of uh, a loss of a lot of personal privacy. And I think as people lose faith in the one system, they're going to be there with the new bunny that they'll pull out the hat and say, here's the new white rabbit for you to follow. Um, and this is our proposal. Um, unfortunately, I don't feel um, that serves us as well as it will serve them. So that's why I think what you proposed is our is our best sovereign action. But I do think there'll be landmines along the way uh, with that. I think it's worth having, potentially, you have to think of a number of things, um, where you're going to hold it, how private you keep your holdings, uh, a mix of silver and gold, because they may find confiscation worthwhile on gold, but it may be a harder ask on the much weightier, lower value silver. So some things might survive. I think there's going to be a few landmines in in the escape hatch that we are prone to choose because they're very, the, the fact that these people would not have game theoried the libertarians' natural response to this key handover moment where we're actually going to say goodbye to a legacy system, in my view, on the large, and we're going to be saying hello to a new system. The the fact that they won't have already um, game theory, the, the likely responses, um, underestimates all the enemy, if you'll allow me that uh, paraphrasing. Um, so people should be very, very careful, um, and uh, they should keep they should keep quiet about their activities. They should uh, invest and have multiple diversify. One of the things we do, we encourage people to have diversified arbitrage of geolocation for any uh, holding of precious metals. So uh, numismatic might give you some protection as well in your local currency uh, versus having um, others. So it's not a bad idea to have eagles in the US, maybe it might be a good idea to have Krugerrands in South Africa and uh, sovereigns or Britannias in the UK, for example. Um, some amount of numismatic that might have a value attached to it for old. You, you want to have a lot of diversification. I'm even a fan of silver granules by lower weight sizes, where it's literally smoothed um, little uh, granules that you can weigh and do bartering trade. So you want to have different levels of financial contribution in case you get reduced to having to contract uh, transactionally for minor items like some food with a farmer. Um, so that is a little bit wow, are you really dystopian to that extent? Um, I think there's no harm for preparing for that level of downside. I think you should also have some paper cash in your currency because that's going to be uh, 
less surveillance, and they will still have to give notice to taper its invalidity. So it will remain valid and you will have to be notified at what point that they will retire physical cash. But it's no doubt that they will still intend to do it. Despite that, it's going to have its highest value to you when we are deflating as we are. In actual fact, it will increase in buying power. And there's such a small amount of the total um, market cap of money that's been created that is actually physical. So wealth could come down to how much of it you physically own. So you could be a billionaire, but only have a few thousand uh, dollars on you uh, and actually be in a squeeze. And you could be someone who's worth, you know, a quarter of a million. But if you have $50,000 during a period where we are in system down, bank failure, all forms of problem reaction solution where we are having systemic failure. Because as I've said, we're going over one side of this cliff, the cliff and it tapers to a point. So eventually you run out of runway and the plane won't have taken off. So you're toppling over. So I think you have to think about intermediate solutions um, that will protect you in the order of uh, various stages of possible collapse. That isn't a prediction. It's just preparing for worst. And hey, if we don't go that far down, no great issue. Cash will actually has been one of the best investments uh, recently in contracting in uh, an asset environment where everything else contracts physically held in your um, hand is actually been quite a good investment. Now, when it comes to the availability of physical metal, it seems like we're seeing retailers across the board being wiped out, wholesalers having very little product at, at, on hand. Um, your perspective on that, and I know last time we had you on, you were talking about how there was a possibility of gold falling further. Is that still your view? And if we see that, will we be even be able to get physical at those prices? That's a very good point, and it comes to the relevance of the paper price. At what point does the paper price seem to be meaningful? Uh, and could you end up with a two-tier market where you get the actual in your hand, uh, you might argue we're already there, um, gold price. So a small uh, little clip it's for particularly a US-based audience of intelligence of what's gone on in Britain, because you might not get the same valid uh, access to this. I know you have a very American-centric um, guest list and audience. So in the UK, I'll pass this on to you from um, a gold dealer that we have a relationship with. In this month, his demand has gone up over 618% month average over all 12 months before. So if you average out his past 12 months, his current month is 618% in demand increased for precious metals. So chew on that. And his largest part of his market is the financial services sector that are deeply concerned about system sustainability, high end. You're talking C-class um, and very high level executives, things you would probably refer to as vice presidents in the US that probably have managing director type profiles in the state, uh, the UK. So he has seen a disordinate and uh, they are saying some things that they'd prefer to be confidential that he will not disclose, but that are basically surround the sustainability of the system in its entirety. So the, it might sound a little bit, particularly for someone who um, gets a lot of their news sources from mainstream sources that have been a bit dramatic, and I'm a bit Armageddonist about the system. So here I'm giving you third party information from a reliable person that I've met many, many times and we have uh, relationships with, who's for the first time sent me out of his own accord an update on these demand change and where it's coming from and their reasons at a top line level. Some of them have not, don't want to be quoted on any specifics. So you can think and, uh, uh, and speculate on that. But the rats in the very ship that we're talking about that is burning on fire are jumping. And they're jumping to gold. They're not demanding um, dollar deposits, even though they would certainly outperform the pound, both in interest rates and in uh, rates. They are going straight to the barbaric relic of many millennia. millennia. So um, whether you want to con consider it a barbaric relic or do you want to consider it as well-established collateral that will not go away, um, which is more my camp and thinking, and I suspect much of your audience. So with that... Um, 
you know, that that microcosm of response in a, a, ge a, ge a geology or geography that the Americans are not familiar with, that is what's happening. And these are well-educated, high up financial services uh, demand that are almost overwhelming him. That definitely is what we're seeing here um, is, you know, a huge amount of demand for precious metals. And when it comes to, you know, the the very wealthy in the world, it seems like there's a demand from them as well as we're seeing on the LBMA and the COMEX physical metals just being drained from them. Levels are very low, almost to the lowest points. Um, I believe on the LBMA, the lowest point since they started recording it. And for the COMEX, you know, it's under 40 million ounces of silver um, on the COMEX right now. So your perspective, how it's not just on the retail level, it seems like on the major exchanges as well, someone is taking physical delivery. Uh, uh, absolutely. And uh, Part of the USD JPY trade, because you might you might wonder why am I talking about an FX pair when you've asked me a question about metals. Um, the Japanese uh, supposedly dumped a large amount of US treasuries in a bid to stop one of their assets on their balance sheet, which is obviously foreign to them, and to prevent their currency from further depreciation. They did an almost not-for-profit slam dump sale that had quite a material effect on the dollar, which we're still feeling a little bit of. China has been saying to its banks to uh, sell US-based assets, in spite of the fact that they've already been doing this for far earlier than you should expect. But now they're trying to talk it down as well as do it. So what you're actually seeing is an accelerant. Now, I'm expecting that a large amount of that collateral uh, is A, to help try reduce the rate at which their own currency is going down and to put some sell pressure on the dollar. But I expect the proceeds of that will also be converted, particularly into uh, precious metals. And we've we've got on history and record that not a single ounce of Chinese gold has ever been exported, and they've been the biggest net importer. And I think that's a well-established known fact that's not new uh, through Hong Kong and a variety um, of others. And what we're actually seeing is a renationalization of capital. So we've called for the Hong Kong dollar peg to fail, and what we, we saw a massive sell-off in the Hang saying this is flight capital that is getting out of Hong Kong, and that is selling the Hong Kong dollar. For dollars, um, so what we're seeing is everyone pulling back uh, uh, the deglobalization, also of investment. So we saw that on the supply chain with the bifurcation with Russia, etc., and everything. So what's ha actually happening is everybody wanting to hold their own stuff inside their own borders, and and when they get uh, any proceeds out of dollar sales, I'm imagining that that is once again adding to the flow out of the West to the east uh, in gold. And I think gold uh, purchases by central banks uh, and home offices and very big investments will absolutely be at highs and will have been um, leading potentially the retail market, as it is with these financial managing directors and C-class British folk that are deeply concerned about the pounds prospects, the bond market there, et cetera, et cetera. So short-circuiting to gold is uh, smart because of supply related uh, issues. I would just again reiterate, if you're born in the States, you have an American passport and you're subject to American tax law, your company is American, your birth certificate, everything is American. You might want to, and this is a specialist speciality we deal with, to actually have a different entity that has a, a, a national, which is based offshore, for holding your precious metals that is secure and very uh, safe and will be an asset that if you have local seizure by national decree uh, inside America, you still have some of your metals outside of that jurisdiction. And that's something we specialize in. And it's also something that you can do and it will not be named either. So you can use entities such as foundations um, to secure that. And uh, I know this sounds like a complexity and there's cost in setting this up, but you really have to think about what governments will have the power to do. I think we're gonna go into a very draconian period where there's gonna be a lot of decree. Many people's experience of COVID, you know, uh, employee mandates and a lot of things, a lot of shocking, um, observations about your full degree of choice when the chips are really down. And I would want to say to people, don't bet on your own government not getting a bit mean uh, and a little bit uh, draconian. And you want to have something that, A, 
O lives beyond your years, and B is in a different jurisdiction, but is equally to a similar standard secure, um, and that you can visit, and isn't that far away from America, and that's one of our solutions. I think, as you mentioned, like the more diversity, the better. I think uh, in this situation where we don't know what's going to happen in the future, the more spread out your wealth can be, I think is so and so important. And um, so, Francis, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your insights with us. We'll definitely have to have you back on uh, to get an update on everything we've discussed today. But where can our viewers find you online if they're interested in learning um, more? Oh, thank you for that opportunity, Elijah, you're a gentleman. Um, we'd love people just to go to the YouTube channel and subscribe uh, where we do technical chart assessment on price. Um, we we are no one's perfect when talking about the future, but we've called for silver, single digit oil that pre, was a precursor to the COVID crash. It was in the charts for us. We've called big moves in the precious metals, both to the upside and the downside in the paper pricing. Um, and we continue to be biased to the risk off trade short and to the dollar dominance trade. And that served us very, very well. So if you want updates there, a lot of that is free. And if you choose to engage further, there's links in the YouTube channel. And of course, the the, the website, as you uh, very kindly mentioned, is the market singular sniper dot com. If you wish to book a call and have a chat, we like to speak to everybody. We like to make sure there's no unrealistic expectations of what you can achieve, but you can learn a method that you can watch the flow of the money. The footprints in the sand of uh, the tracking uh, is always in the charts and the big money moves markets. And we like to get facts of what's truly happening rather than news media narrative. All right. Well, we'll put the links for all of those in the description of this video. Once again, Francis, thank you so much for your time and insights today. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me on, Elijah. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A-plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we will let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be double boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Elijah, my brother Kaiser, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.